In today's video, we are stepping away from wargaming miniatures and instead seeing what it's like to paint some board game miniatures and how to use a game's art to help inspire your painting process. I was lucky enough to get a commission to paint some board game miniatures at a time when I needed a break from Infinity as I had just painted the Megalodron, which just sapped any energy I had for a new Infinity project. If you want to see how I did with that though, you can check out the video in the link. The board game miniatures I was requested to paint were the hero units from the game Scythe. Scythe is a game set mostly in Eastern Europe as an alternative 1920s post-industrial revolution where mechs are a thing and players control a hero from one of the European nations as they compete for domination. To be honest, I have never played the game myself, but what intrigues me the most about it is the beautiful artwork by Jakub Rosalski a Polish artist that makes these beautiful paintings that appear to me anyway very much influenced by the late 19th century and early 20th century realism landscapes, especially those depicting farmers toiling the land and early industry. The only difference being that in Jacob's work, there are these great big mechs that are also within the frame. And it says a lot about the artist's vision and talent that the two differing themes are blended so convincingly together. All right, I'm getting a bit distracted by the art here, but I wanted to make a point of it as it can help give us as mini painters a theme or direction for our own painting. And as there is artwork for each of the heroes that I am painting, I wanted the painting of the models to somewhat reflect the beautiful art of the game. So before picking up a brush, I got each character's artwork and identified the colors within the picture. You can do this with many programs, but I used GIMP to color pick the clothing, face, equipment, and animal's fur, feathers, or glowy bits. When looking at art, you can assume the picture is using a specific color, but on further inspection, you can find so many varied colors that the artist has used that trick your eye into seeing something that might not actually be there. Using this method, you can more accurately get a sense of the colors that are actually present and hopefully with this knowledge, give a better representation of the art in the mini painting. Am I only going to use these colors that I found in the art? Well, no, no I am not. Mini painting is still a different art form to landscape painting and every artist for any medium will have the style that they gravitate towards, whether intentionally or not. But the research into the artwork is invaluable in helping me decide what colors to use. I already know that if I limited myself to these particular colors, my models are going to look drab, with details fuzzy and hard to make out. It works in a painting, but translating those colors directly into a tiny little figure would not look good or even appear to be a good representation of the art. So, now that I am informed on what colors are in the art and using my own experience with mini painting, I can choose what tones to use and up the saturation of the colors to help make all the details pop and also put a bit of my own style into the work. Okay, enough ranting on the theory. Let's pick up that brush now and slap some paint on the minis. I started with the British guy for, well, reasons I'm sure you can imagine when listening to my accent. The artwork has a lot of earthy green tones that have a soft hue that is very reminiscent of British wetlands covered in dew on an early morning. Diluted greens were going to be an overarching influence of the piece with gentle browns being secondary and finally some blue to add a bit more variety. The boar especially had very desaturated browns and my lack of experience painting fur made painting it a daunting task. To get the desaturated brown, I simply mixed in a light blue-gray with the brown and attempted wet blending between the highlights and the shadows. With all the base colors down, I continued to pick out details with highlights and this is where the saturation of my painting and the artwork differed. However, I was happy with how the first model came out. 
Now, much of my approaches were very similar with the rest of the model, so rather than talk about the specific painting techniques that I used, I want to talk more about how the artwork influenced my painting choices and colour palette. I was painting all of these on stream, and my viewers helped to choose the next mini in the series to paint. <coughs> Twitch stream plug. We decided on painting the Tesla influenced character with the shock sticks and mechanical fox. The artwork for her had a lot of deep warm red browns contrasted with cold bright blues and whites for the electricity and uniform trim. I must admit I found her a lot harder to enjoy in painting than the British dude as her frame was quite small and it meant with the plastic that the models were made from many of the details were muddled and hard to paint to the same standard as the former miniature. Now, living in Japan as I am, it was hard to pass up having a go at the Japanese-inspired character with the cute little monkey. Compared to all the other characters in the series, she had the most saturation of colour with the warm purple and deep turquoise. I took this as an excuse to use a lot of saturation and worked with colours to create contrast between light and shadow. I have to admit, after the Tesla model, I had so much fun painting this miniature that my motivation was brought back to a high. After doing a model with so much saturation of colour, the next was almost devoid of colour, as I had a go at painting the German soldier with a black furred wolf. Although the art has little to no colour, there is still strong contrasts of blacks, whites and greys. These are then made even more powerful by the presence of a little red in the uniform. Of all the miniatures I painted, I feel this model best captured the artwork it was based off of. We then moved on to this lovely lady from the Crimea, with a beautiful mottled red dress. Mixing in a lot of earthy tones, but keeping this red as the colour to bring it all together, it gave her a warmer, rosier atmosphere than the other miniatures in the series. One point of difficulty for painting was the fact that the space between the bow's limb and string was filled with plastic from the mould. I feel it would have been better not to have sculpted the string and just kept the limb, but perhaps that was not possible in the moulding process. To get around this, I painted the background sky with a light blue grey and for the reverse side also painted the outline of the character's shoulder and painted it to hopefully blend it in with the model. This was one of those challenges of doing something new and I'm proud to say I think it came out alright. Next up was the Rasputin model and similar to the Tesla character had a lot of contrast between black and orange. I took this as an opportunity to paint the skin tone of vampiric pale and then used only grayscale to paint the clothing. All the trim was to be orange, so to give it a range, I used a deep red and worked my way up. Even with a lack of range of colours, the stark contrast between the black and orange worked for the model and along with the pale skin tone gave this character a unique atmosphere to the others in the series. The Polish girl with a bear was similar in colour palette to the British soldier, but had overall darker shades and military greens with some added orange for her hair. The bear was the biggest of the animals I had painted yet and was a little intimidating, but using the wet blending techniques I had been using for the other animals, I was still happy with the result. She came out a lot lighter than I was originally planning, so the final result is quite different in atmosphere from the art. With the bear done, it was now time to tackle the largest animal, with the Nordic fella riding what looks like a bison. To reflect the northern cold of Scandinavia and its long winter nights, there's a lot of cold purple mixed in with the earthy tones. This was a lot of fun to paint, and using colour in an unrealistic way to create an atmosphere that is believable is a fantastic quality to art. Just to be clear, I am praising the original artwork, not my passable attempts at imitation on a teeny tiny model. I added some of the purple tones into the skin of the rider to help exaggerate the cold of his environment, but really upped the contrast on the hair to make it stand out that bit more on the tabletop. Finally, it was time to take on the Russian girl with the Siberian tiger. This had to have been the most intimidating animal to paint, as I not only had to deal with fur, but also the striped pattern. With this in mind, I avoided painting the tiger completely and focused on the lady instead. 
Similar to the German soldier, she was wearing a lot of black. However, the material looked to have a lot of leather and so had a more glossy reflective texture. This meant adding a lot more light greys to the highlights to give a stronger, more sudden contrast, giving the impression of a reflective surface. Once I was happy with her paint job, I had no more procrastinating or distractions to take me away from the challenge of the tiger. All the practice of the other animals was all leading to this. Could I paint a convincing tiger? I continued with the wet blending to create highlights and shadow. I thought that going with pure white for some of the fur was going to be a little too unnatural, so instead went with a dark ivory. So far so good, but it was looking more like a lion. It needed those stripes. So using the picture for reference and just using my best judgment, which with experience I know not to be the best, I went about either making or breaking the model. Oh, okay, it turned out to be a lot less intimidating than I thought it would be and looked all right. It's funny how scary something can be in your head, but when you actually try it, it isn't so bad. I just had some finishing touches to do on the bases. I wanted the base to reflect the art's landscape as much as possible and approach them with the colors from the pictures. After repainting the rims, the models were complete and ready for their final photo shoot. was a much smaller scale to what I am used to painting, but offered a fun challenge as each model had a unique stylistic design and color palette. The models themselves are made of a lower quality plastic than what I am used to, and this causes some fudging of details. I certainly prefer painting my high quality 28 mm figures, but for the fact that these take a fraction of the time to paint, they are a great way to take a break from intensive painting sessions. Which of the models do you think came out the best? And which of these fabulous characters would you play in a game of Scythe? I would have to say I would go for the British guy with a boar. I know, I know. Boring. Big thank you to my supporters on Patreon. And if you want to see the full painting process for these miniatures, they are being released as a series exclusive to Patreon. Also, thank you to my viewers and subscribers on Twitch. You guys made it a joy to paint these miniatures together. And of course, a big thank you to you watching this video right now. I appreciate you taking the time to watch this content. And if you want to see more, please like and subscribe. See you all in the next video.